Um, and we're sitting here at the Four Wheel Parts headquarters in Compton, California. And Craig, this is, uh, here we go. <laughs> Damn, you are on it today. <laughs> this is actually my favorite. So that, that's it. That's all we get. And that's good. So, uh, Craig, thank you for joining us. Sure. Do you have any idea what's going on? No, so far all I've done is listen to you talk the whole entire time. Yes. So how's it been? Good. It's been great. And yeah. in fact, I was so shocked to hear you say that you look up to me. I thought for sure that would be a great opportunity to feel like not, I don't literally look up to him. Well, I was going to get to that. We're going to get to th there. There will be a plethora of short jokes scattered throughout here. <laughs> Craig, Craig is a lot of power in in, in a little package. <laughs> it's, it's like a AAA battery. Little dogs live longer than big dogs. Is that is that is that true? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, Craig, uh, real quick kind of history of who you are and what you do. We'll dig deeper into it into a minute as far as like your history and stuff. But um, I'll tell the listeners how I know you. And the reason why we have a relationship is I met you through Polaris. Uh, when I came on as an ambassador and started working with Polaris at the time, you were the CMO <clears throat> of the company, right? Yeah. CMO is a high level executive, which is the basically the person in charge of all the marketing. At that time it was, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I spent a long time in the off-road group too. Running. How uh, long were you with Polaris? Uh, I've been with Polaris for, this is my 15th year. So oh, That's right, you're still so with So Transamerican and Four Wheel Parts is owned by Polaris, so, you know, I'm still an executive at Polaris. i just on the West Coast running this company now. That's right, you're still on the same executive team. So that's the one thing about Polaris a lot of people don't realize is they're not just UTVs, they're not just Razors and Rangers. Polaris goes out and they've bought a lot of companies over the years. They acquired Transamerican Auto Parts, which is uh, better known as Four Wheel Parts, which is what Joey here um, is basically handling all the marketing for Craig and Joey have known each other forever. You guys dated in college or? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, uh, so they've, they've known each other forever. He's the father of my first child. That's so sweet. It's yeah. I, I love a good love story. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's these guys, uh, you guys are like brothers in a lot of ways, but at the same time you've managed to work together over the years, which is, is tricky navigating business and pleasure. I guess, or friendship. Yeah. I always say business and friendship. I like pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> business, pleasure, friendship, it's all the same thing. Um, Craig, you just moved to LA from? From Minneapolis. Yeah, I was in the western suburbs of Minneapolis working for Polaris. I've been out here for about 16 months, living here for about 12 months. Uh, How's that feel? It's that's great. A, that's a great. change. Every day of the year you can go outside. Right. And do something, yeah. And you get like two and a half months out of the year in Minnesota. Yeah. Where you don't get frostbite going exactly, outside. Exactly, exactly. brutal. What I gave up, uh, I gave up, uh, you know, I got good weather, but it picked up traffic. You know, it's so. true. Is it worth it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, the job is what makes it worth it, you know, and, uh, you know, the additional challenge and, right. you know, meeting new people and doing all that stuff. So, so that's, that's one thing, thing, you know, for the listeners uh, hearing this, if you've ever seen in the last 15 years or so, let's call it 10 years, even when you were an executive over there, if you've seen a Polaris Razor or a UTV or Polaris vehicle anywhere, Craig was part of that. Like you were basically overseeing all the marketing between TV and billboards and everything in the company. You weren't necessarily handling every component of it, but that was your division. Yeah, and no, I was I was the general manager of the side by side group for a long time. I, I would tell you the the cool part was I was a D level employee, which is kind of Polaris, not the lowest level, but or you know just an office level or a, wait when you started at Polaris. Yeah. I was uh, my first job at Polaris. I was a salesperson. I, I was a district sales manager in huh. Eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware and Maryland. So I didn't know that. That's awesome. No, nope, And went from sales all the way up through being the general manager of the side-by-side -side group. But the cool part was when I, when I first moved to Minnesota and left sales, uh, my first role there was to launch the razor. So like, really? like, like within three months we were launching the razor, the ranger, awesome. the razor was born <clears throat> from the ranger, right? The Ranger came first. The Ranger was around for eight, nine years before that, but, wow. but totally different vehicles, right? And totally different customers and different uh, lifestyle, different everything. Totally. totally. College education? Yes, I have one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. That's why I'm asking, you yeah. know. Well, here, here's four year degree, <laughs> master's degree. Degree in, uh, degree in uh, accounting and finance. Got it. So my first, uh, right out of college, I was, a, I was a cost accountant. It was super exciting. That sounds great. Can't believe I gave up that work. It I know, was, you should have never it left, was so man. good. Well, those regrets you'll make. Yeah, yeah. No, so the reason why the conversation is relevant and the reason why we, we're bringing Craig to you is because Polaris um, and the, the position that you were in, Polaris does annually $4 billion in sales? Yeah, uh, right around five. Okay, so $5 billion company. Yep. Is that across all groups? Yep. Uh, what Fortune, do you think? Fortune 500 last year for the first time in the history of the company. Really? Nice. Yep. Do they publish what ORV does? No. Well, you can see, you can find out what, what ORV does. It's it's uh, eighty some percent of the company. Jeez. So what he's saying is the razors and the side by sides, those things that you see out there on the trails, consist of just through Polaris alone, 
two, three billion dollars in sales. Yeah, a little bit more than every that, year. Jeez, and that's just you guys. <clears throat> then obviously there's other competitors out there. Yep. So the segment's huge. Segment is huge, but if you think about Polaris, you know, even with the with some of the new vehicles out, Polaris is still twice as much market share in side by sides as their next closest competitor. So if if Can Am is, is Can Am so easy up? math is every time we sell two they sell one. <laughs> that is that is pretty easy math. <laughs> That's how he usually explains things yeah, to me. I like that. Just, I was getting ready. To, he saw me getting ready to go down the, the, the rabbit hole. There is he throwing at this me because I said because I said I didn't go to yeah, college. Yeah. yeah, we keep the math, math real basic at this table, um, which is fine because no college education. Well, no, I got six weeks of college under my belt. You got I think it was four and a half. Four weeks. and a half. You've got some. Yeah. I got it right around six and a half weeks. Six and a half weeks. Yeah. Uh, Joey, do you have any college? Yeah, I do. I got you guys beat. I feel really good about myself what now. What do you got? Uh, I got about six months. <laughs> That's not bad. No, I have a little bit more than that, but I never finished it. I, I got right to work. That's kind of where we were. Yeah. Just got to the point where it's like, I need to go get my hands on things and figure it out myself. You, Craig, is it a four-year degree? Yep. You got? Yeah. Where'd you go to school? University of Maryland. University of Maryland. Where were you? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's a steel town in yeah. the eastern part of PA. Did you grow up thinking that you were going to be an executive of a company? Uh, I thought I would grow up. When I was growing up, my grandfather was kind of my role model, and he owned his own construction company. So we, we've, we've quite often had the conversations over the years, over the years that I've always said to me when we were driving around checking jobs when, we were, when I was like five or six, I was like, I'm going to run your company someday. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I never, when I got out of school, it was, it was like I was from a steel town, small town. Um, it was always like, just keep doing better than you were the day before. Right. You know, like make the next job bigger than the one it was before this and always wanting more and more and more. Yeah. And it just kind of worked out to be, you know, where it got relatively, my career got, you know, I wouldn't say it's bigger or anything like that, but it's, uh, I no, you've got, you, the reason we're talking is because you have a very impressive career, whether you know it or not, or whether I think, you know, it, it's always a little harder to admit it or see it from your point of view, but from the outside looking in, I've seen you personally <clears throat> in the four years that I've known you do big things, handle big problems and make big changes. And, you know, you like a good example of this is the new razor that just came out. You were a big part of that coming together. This is like two years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the Pro XP, which is an awesome vehicle. We started working on that three years ago, four yeah. years ago. I mean, typically a new vehicle is three to five years out of Polaris. So. Three to five years. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, but the thing is, it's a, uh, I mean, I was working on it, yes, but there was, I mean, there's thousands of people working on it, right? right. So it's, uh, those things don't just happen. I mean, the amount of work that goes from start to finish, and then even when they finish the vehicle, getting it to the street and to people, it's, there's so much that goes into it. It's right. crazy. Um, so when you talk about growing up, you looked at your grandpa's company, you looked at saying, I'm going to run your company. But I, I'm guessing a t it's not very common for people to blow up and get out of town in, in Bethlehem, PA. They probably stay put. Yeah, pretty much. There's yeah. a lot. Of, I mean, a lot of my good buddies from high school, they're, they're still in Bethlehem. Kind great of norm, great right? town. Yeah. It's yeah. a cool place to live. Uh, that wasn't enough for you, though. <clears throat> no, I, you know what? It's, uh, I moved away pretty quick. I mean, it, I had the job. I, my first role at school, I was a cost account for a company called Ingersoll Dresser Pumps, which is a company owned by Ingersoll Rand. Right. Uh, and then I moved into a financial analyst role with Ingersoll Rand. And then I entered into their sales and sales and marketing development program, did that for a year and then moved Which that's a shift from accounting though. How did you, I'm, I'm trying to figure yeah, it's out how. An, it's a natural shift. You see it a lot. You see a lot of accountants go into sales. Um, Do you? No, it's I was going to say, never, I've, never I've, happens. I've, I've never seen that. <laughs> no. And then, and then to marketing. So yeah. that's, it's a, it's a drastic swing because those are different worlds. Completely different worlds. Uh, you know, in fact, the, the sales and the marketing is, is way closer than going from finance to, for sure, to sales. And, but you know, I would say the one thing for me that I've always kind of, I've always looked for different things to do. People, you know, there's nothing wrong with being one track and saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a finance person. I'm going to go, I want to be a staff accountant all the way up to a, you know, a controller or a CFO. Right. I've always wanted to kind of go from one spot to the next and learn right. everything. And I always tell the younger folks here, you know, at Polaris, it's like, don't be so focused on just getting a promotion. Right. You know, so many people are like, is this job a higher level than the last job? Who's this job report to? What's it get paid? Uh, when I... When I moved from finance into sales, I took a pay cut and, right. and I actually went down in level. I was ready to move up to be a controller at, at Dinger Saw Rand at the time. I went sideways. And that was a conscious decision you yeah, made. Yeah, I went sideways or back, backwards so, so I could say, okay, I want to learn everything there is to learn about running a business so that one day when I, when I am put in the role, I might not know everything, yep. but I've, been, I've had a little taste of everything. That may sound like a small thing right there, and it sounds you know, somewhat insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but it's not that right there. 
that piece of advice that you just gave is probably one of the most valuable things I've heard on this show because I think a lot of people compare themselves to other people or they compare themselves to other situations. They look at this position and think I got to be there. And until I get there, I'm not going to be happy, you know, grind, grind, grind. And then they get there and they're like, I'm not happy. Right. Where's the satisfaction, the gratification that I thought I was going to feel. It's not there. You, on the other hand, I guess, I don't know how or why you saw that early on, but you were lucky enough to catch that early on and say, I'm going to get more gratification and more worth out of experience and knowledge than I am about getting, you know, one tier higher on the ladder. Right. And so with that, you made a drastic shift into a different part of the business, which was no longer counting beans. You were then doing what? Well, what I, Ingersoll ran out of this really cool training program where they had company owned stores. And as a sales trainee, you would go to a store and you had to work three months in the parts department, three months in the rental department, three months in the, in the, in the shop, you know, fixing construction equipment. And then you'd spend three months traveling with the salesperson and then you get your own territory. <clears throat> so it was kind of cool. And the reason why they did it that way and the reason why Polaris' program's kind of set up the same way now is that when I was a salesperson, my job was to sell heavy highway equipment and, and uh, you know, blast hole drills and big, big highway equipment in, in Maryland. A lot of the a lot of the work was done at night by service guys. You know, they'd be paving a road at night right. and the service guy would get, get called out at 3 a.m. Well, the reason huh. why they wanted us to do that was because that's the stuff we were asking people to go do, uh-huh. right? And if you're going to ask somebody to go do it, you might as well have done it yourself. Right. And it, ch- it kind of changed the way I looked at it because a lot of times if, if a, a service technician got called out at 3 o'clock at night to go work on a, 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 a compaction equipment, I would, I would load up in my truck and go take them some coffee and donuts and stuff. Hmm. It just makes you think a little bit more when you've actually lived in people's shoes before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so much harder to actually manage and lead people when you're like, when you kind of have never done what they've done before. You can't relate to them at mm-hmm. all. Right. Uh, that's one thing. This is why I'm really excited about this podcast. A lot of the people that we interview are self-employed or they're entrepreneurs. They're somebody who started the business and they've grown it. Joe, you've been in that world. You did a UTV underground and now you've made a drastic shift to working for a corporation. Um, he loves it, by the way. I Absolutely guarantee you. Well, I, I've, seen, I've seen him more comfortable and more stress-free here. I mean, obviously that's a grind and you're like hustling every day, but it's a different kind of stress. It's like a productive type of stress. It's like, you're not worried about paying the bills every day. You're more worried about hitting those benchmarks and being more productive. So that's what I try to express to people is there's so many people, especially listeners to this podcast and in this culture and the society that feel like if they're not an entrepreneur, if they don't have their own business, they haven't made it yet. And that's just so wrong because owning a business isn't for everyone. Have you ever owned your own business, Craig? No. That's why I love this conversation because you have basically built multiple businesses within other businesses. And that's what we refer to as the entrepreneur type, right? Billion, mm-hmm. billion dollar businesses. Billion that dollar brands. businesses. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you were able to do that leveraging resources of big corporations and guys like you are literally invaluable to big companies because you treat the company as if it was your own. And yeah. people <clears throat> that are listening to this, I want you to understand that just because your dad at a plumbing company doesn't mean that you're not successful if you don't either go take over the plumbing company or start your own thing. Maybe you weren't meant to have your own business. Like that's just, you got to have that hard conversation with yourself and think, what's my taste for risk? How do I feel if I lose everything? Am I okay if I lose everything? How many hours a day do I want to work? Am I okay, you know, having to have the stress of support, supporting, you know, 50 to 100 employees? These are the questions that you got to ask yourself early on because owning a business is sexy from the outside looking in. It's like, oh, you know, he's got his own lifestyle, his own schedule. There's so much that goes into it that people don't realize and don't think about. So I try to make sure that people are at least examining and seeing everything for what it really is. The opportunity to go work in a corporation or corporate America, as people refer to it, or go start and run your own business. Those are essentially the two basic options. There's some hybrid jobs in between, between, (coughs) you know, real estate agents and people like in sales positions, but Ultimately, you made the decision, and it sounds like it wasn't even a conscious decision. It sounds like that's this is you knew you were going this way all along. You wanted to go in and do big things for companies, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, but, uh, to go back to what you said, I mean, there are two options. I, w- I would say there's almost like a third option too. It's if you want to have your own business someday, there's nothing wrong with going and working at a company and seeing best practices and how things are done. Um, the worst thing you can do is start your own business when you're not ready to start your own business, 100%. you know, and, and the other part too, is I, I think it would, for, for somebody who, like you talked about the plumbing with the, you know, your father's business, it doesn't mean you have to get out of college or go out of high school and go work directly for your father. You could go work at other businesses. So you can bring that stuff back to make that business your father or mother started even better. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that's a third option. I would say 
who knows? I mean, uh, I'm 45 years old now, and uh, you know, I've worked for corporations since uh, since I was out of college. But you never know. One day I could own my own company, and I'll take all the the stuff I learned here. Right. I would say the one thing about why I, I've always liked working at Players is one, it's tremendously passionate about the products, you know, and and the people. And but I think the other part too is having access to so many smart people. Right. You know, and having access to so many resources to go even faster and build things even faster than if maybe, you know, you, you own your own business. Um, Shortens you know, your learning curve, 100%. For sure, and and the speed at which you can operate is way mm-hmm. faster too because, uh, you know, typically in situations like this, you're, you have more resources than most small businesses or most, you know, family-owned businesses have. Right. Um, so so for me, you know, it's it's kind of always been, a, a, you know, I, I had in the back of my mind of having my own company, but it's always gone so well here and, and I've always been challenged and every single time I start to get a little bit bored in one role, another role like this one pops up, pops and, up. and the challenge starts all over again, you yeah. know? And uh, the other part too is, uh, that's another part. I, I think if I own my own business, I would probably get bored pretty fast. Yep. Um, but you don't have that option. I have no, when you're, when you're mar- no. no, when you have your own business, <clears throat> you can't get bored. You're going to get bored. But it's not an option because you're married to it because you've already you're so all in you're invested. Joey, could you walk away from UTV Underground after two years of getting in there and just grinding oh, and just no. one day step you're, away? You're all in. You don't even realize the time. Yeah, you know you're just you're so committed that early on. Yep. But yep. there is that big misconception to go with what you were saying a moment ago of you know people thinking that they have to be an entrepreneur. You know, right. I listen to a lot of podcasts and it seems to be the underlying sort of. Um, uh, tone it's cool. is that it's like, yeah, like, you, you know, you got to work to own your own company. That's where you make all the money and nothing can be further from the truth in so many ways. I w- I was a guy who had a 12 year career working for the man, right? Started my own company. Doing what? Um, I worked for a manufacturer, an outdoor lighting manufacturer, something really not sexy and cool. Job. <laughs> yeah. I started when I was 16 winding transformers on an assembly line and yeah. started working my way up. And then UTV underground was a hobby, a passion. It took off. Thankfully to meeting people like Craig and other people, I was able to build relationships and partnerships and grow that company. And that was 10 years. And I did what's kind of taboo, which is I went from being an entrepreneur to an intrapreneur. Right. I went back to working for the man. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I mean, I talked about this with Craig. <laughs> Craig's the, the man. That, yeah, 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 I work for the man. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'll tell you that after being here a year, um, I said this the other day, if I would have known what I've learned in this past year, I would have been so much more dangerous with my own company based on being surrounded with true professionals and um, working in an environment like this can take a guy who, you know, I got a lot of passion and drive and I want to progress and, you know, I want to have a big, awesome career. Um, But you can do that working for people too. Right. And you can love a brand just like it's your own. Yeah. Um, and so it's special to be here and have an opportunity to do that and be an entrepreneur now. So I think that would be probably one of the best pieces of advice that we could take away from this conversation right now is if you have that stress and that anxiety of wanting to own your own business and be an entrepreneur, that's okay. You can continue to pursue that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it tomorrow. Jumping in, thinking like, you know, you always hear jump in, just do it, just go to work, just, right. just do it. There's a lot of power in that. And there's also a lot of stupidity in that. Mm-hmm. Like, don't jump in just to jump in when you have no idea what you're doing. A good option, alternative to what uh, kind of playing off what you just said is go work for a company that does something kind of along the lines of what you want to do. Go learn from them because it's free education to avoid that or to shorten that learning paid. curve. It's paid. paid it's exactly. It's paid. So g- getting a paycheck from a job is should be the least valuable thing that you get there right? The most value that you can get from a job is exactly what you guys are telling us. It's that education, that experience, that hands-on, um, watching things, how they should be done or how they shouldn't be done. And then let's say you do break off and do start your own company. You already have all that. You know that you don't have to make those same mistakes yourself. You're still going to make mistakes, but you're not gonna make the dumb ones. And you're gonna make less of the big mistakes because you learned it on somebody else's dime. And that's the way that the business world works. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would tell you that if you're going to do that, don't go into a company and just take everything that they have and copy and paste because it doesn't work. No. How many no. times have you guys seen that happen? Oh yeah. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. And I can tell you after being, you know, I, I'd like to think my company was successful. It depends on how you measure it, but I had a great career. You know, I loved my brand. Um, I did a lot with it. I made the money I needed to make. It was awesome. Um, being here, dude, I don't want to go back to owning my own company. Are you kidding me? 
This is awesome because it's, there's a That's lot of a shame, Joey, because today's your last day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was kidding. I can't wait to him. <laughs> Joey's farewell tour. <laughs> no, but it's, I'm dead serious. Like, I don't want to go back. I love the freedom right. that comes with working. There's, there's things you give up. And yeah. I say freedom, it's not like a schedule freedom or any of those things. There's additional responsibilities working for a big company like right. this. But it's so fun because I'm surrounded by so many smart people right. and so many people that are after the same goal. And you have this big team that otherwise with your own business, unless you're able to build it up in some monster, you never have. You yeah. know, you got a few people you can really rely on here. I can go find out anything I want to know about about this company or this industry by walking down a hallway. Yeah, um, you have access to an cool. army and everybody's Literally. got the same, you know, initiative. Yep. Craig, if you were to go back in time and give 25-year-old Craig some advice regarding your career path, what would you tell them? Oh, geez, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, cause honestly, I think a lot of what has happened is because I've taken calculated risk, right? And you know, I, I there was never any roles I, t I took that were completely out of my realm of meaning being successful. They were all a stretch. But they were all a stretch yeah. and they all taught me something new. And, and I would say, to be honest with you, I kind of like the way it turned out. So I think the uh, the advice to myself was- And the advice can be <laughs> exactly what you thing. did, yeah. You know, uh, it's just surround yourself. Early on in my career, it, I found myself competing with people I worked with yeah. more than realizing that we all, there's, there's room for everybody, you know, and there's room for everybody to be success successful. So is competition a good thing? I think, I think a fair amount of competition within a company with, with folks that are on the same team is good. But anything that, you know, anything overplayed becomes a negative, right? And I think there was at times for me when I was coming up through uh, my, my desire to be successful and my drive sometimes made me push people away that probably could have made me smarter and faster and, and stronger in the business world a lot faster. Right. Did you yeah. grow up, uh, what kind of family? Middle class, lower class? Uh, middle, middle class. I would say middle to, you know, lower class. I did, mean, did you have a chip on your shoulder yeah. growing up thinking that you needed to do better than where you came from? For sure. I still have a chip on my shoulder. I feel like everybody from the lower middle class has that, because like, I'm the same way. I don't want someone to say I was poor, but I definitely, well, I don't think we were in middle class. I think we were just a step above poor. Like, And I just have this like hunger and this drive to never experience certain things again. Right. And that's what's driven me to be able to, to do what I do and ultimately have success. I knew that I was going to be successful whether I drove a garbage truck or whether I drove monster trucks for a living. Like I knew that I was going to be successful and I knew I was going to make money at it because I wasn't going to allow myself to ever feel... I have a few key memories as a child where I was just like, nope, I never, ever, ever want to mm -hmm. deal with that again. And I never want my kids or anybody I love to have to go through that. And it's nothing major and traumatic. It's just little things like when your mom has to make your clothes or you right. don't, you, you're seven years old and you have to wear a pair of size 13 Goodwill shoes to, to, to school. Like that kind of stuff is like that right there is enough to drive me to make those big decisions and take those hard calculated risks like you were talking about. Right. Um, so you felt like you did have that growing up that, that, that oh, for sure. You know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I talked about my grandfather's construction company, it wasn't, it was a small construction company. It wasn't, and my mom was a single mom until I was eight years old. No, no father in the picture. Um, you know, so growing up like that, you kind of, yeah, you, of course you get the kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to beat the world type, type attitude. Your, you didn't, your dad wasn't around after age what? Since, uh, since, uh, since I was, since I could remember. Okay. And how many kids in the family? Uh, my sister and I. Well, there's two stepbrothers now. I got Matt and Chris, my two stepbrothers, and my sister. You were Gina. the oldest? I was the, my, my sister's the oldest on the second one. And so you were the only boy in the family. You were kind of the man of the house in a lot of ways. Right? Yeah. Yeah. My mom worked, uh, you know, my mom worked a full-time job at UPS. She started as a clerk there. And when she retired, she was a national account manager and things like that. Went back to school while we were growing up. I mean, we were, my sister and I were, you know, relatively, you know, independent. Like we got ourselves to school. We got ourselves home from school. We got ourselves fed. My mom, you know, worked as a, as a as a person at the counter at UPS and went back to college at night. And wow. we had a lot of help with families, a big Italian family in, in Pennsylvania. So, yeah. you know, we had we had a lot of support. You know, you know, we never went hungry or anything like that. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't like my kids are growing up. You know, yeah, or your kids. I mean, <laughs> I, I I talked to my son who has a new pair of basketball shoes on every six minutes and uh, and <laughs> and talked about like the first time I had a new pair of football cleats was <laughs> when I was like when I was a playing in high school and they gave them to me. Dude, we were just talking about that talking on the plane right that down. Is yeah. My first dirt bike was a 1976 YZ80 and I literally pulled loans from like nine different places and scrapped together all my savings to get the $80 that it cost to buy the bike. And then I, you know, that was my first bike and it literally meant the world to me. That bike, yeah. I remember the first time I... I hit the gear shifter and it st uh, stripped the, the splines on the shifter and my shift lever became like 
floppy dick. <laughs> and I was I, like, I was, I was ruined. Like that was the end of my world because that was my most prized possession because it was $80. And to me, that was a lot of freaking money. We talk about our kids now, like all of us at this table have done well. Like we've gotten to the point where we're comfortable, we're successful, but we all have, everybody has young kids, right? How old's your youngest, Joey? Yeah. Um, baby C is uh, 10 now. 10. Yeah. You, your youngest is 10? 11. 11. Um, Dave's youngest is a year. Should be one on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> one year old Piper. My youngest is two and a half, Mac, and then yours is four. So <laughs> when you, <laughs> this is, this is funny. I tell people all, this, all the time. One of the most difficult parts about making it is when you actually make it because you, you, it, it comes with this whole new set of problems that you weren't anticipating, like creating a realistic childhood for your children. Yeah. yeah. Like my daughter, Charlie, she flies to Lake Powell on a helicopter on Saturday and we fly home and she's home in time for school on Monday. And then she tells the kids in the class, like, it's like a normal thing. Like it's not, it wasn't a big adventure. It was a weekend right. at our house. And I don't want my daughter to think that that stuff came for free. I don't want her to think that you don't have to do anything for that. And I, so we've, we've, I've started putting my kids in situations where they, I almost make them have to learn things the hard way simply because uh, it's the only way that they're going to fully appreciate and value certain aspects of life. Sure. Is there anything that you do with your kids to help them understand this stuff? Yeah. Like make them do everything. Make them work. For sure. It's, it's it, and, and it's like, it's the hardest thing to do, but all weekend, you know, it's past weekend. It's like, you want to have a party at our house? We'll go spend you know, spray down everything, clean everything up, get the, get everything ready. You want stuff from the store? Well, come to That's the store. just the Italian dad in you, though. That's right, but then it's the next day. It's like clean everything up and put everything back the way it was. And one thing I'm stressing with my, my oldest son right now is when you enter a room, take a mental snapshot of what that room looked like before you entered into it. <laughs> and when you leave, go, but when, when you leave, take another mental snapshot. If it doesn't look the same, there's a problem. Make it, make it look the same. Yeah. So, no, it's just holding them accountable, right? It's, uh, and, and every once in a while, you, it's, it gets tough, right? Because, you know, they're, you walk outside and their bike's laying in the middle of the driveway or they, they're just not treating things the way I, like you talk about that right. dirt bike. That was my baseball glove, right? Yeah. My baseball glove was like, like, was like gold to me growing up. And the, you know, you walk in and there's a, there's a cleat out in the middle of the yard and there's one inside the, you know, the mud room and this, that, and the other, and you just got to hold them accountable and make them do stuff as opposed to doing it for them. You know, I think a lot of times what parents do is they just, well, they left the they left a plate on the counter. I'll, I'll put it away for them. No, I, I, I'll, I'll take the extra time and go to their room and make them come out and put that plate away. Um, I, need seems my, like, I need my wife to listen to this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> seems like simple stuff, but it really is kind of. What about the hustle? Because that's my thing, man. If I didn't, if I didn't, if I wanted something when I was young, yeah, I was in a position where I had to figure out how to get it. Yep. And it's like I was telling Dave, my kids race dirt bikes, right? My son's eight years old and he's had probably seven new dirt bikes, brand new, you know? So it's like my, my thing is this. Me? Yeah. <laughs> Free dirt bike well, sounds like a good deal. Like here in yeah. your office. <laughs> but I, I just think it's like, okay, how do I teach him the hustle aspect? It's like, hey, if you want something, you got to go get it while we're trying to race and be competitive yeah. and I'm buying a brand new bike. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally get it. It's, it's a tough Where's one. Where's the right? balance? There, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't have the balancing point, to be honest with you. It's, it's kind of just the way you talk to them and treat them, I think, a lot of ways. Right. I mean, my kids aren't allowed to do anything slow. Like, nothing. Like, if we get out of the truck to walk in the grocery store, it's like, let's go hustle up. You know, it's- <laughs> That's the Italian again, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, you, we need bread. You're walking the bread aisle. If they're loafing, it's like, hey, hustle up. Joey, let me ask you See this. See how I did that? The bread and the loaf at the same time? <laughs> no, <Nah>, bread, <laughs> they, they bread and they're loafing. But that was so good. Yeah, so slick yeah. that it just went straight <laughs> over me. Uh, as somebody who's worked for Craig, does that sound a little bit like his management technique as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's definitely a, a high pace atmosphere around here, right? And um, But he pushes you to be better too. That's so a it's a safe answer. Look at yeah. you. I know. No, it's, <laughs> it's the dead truth. Let's I mean, get, Let's get Brooke, our HR guy in here. We're going <laughs> yeah. to up Joey's bonus for the year. <laughs> how, much, how much crossover do you see between parenting and managing employees? You know, I, I, I don't think that I'm going to say something online about, you know, how I'm parenting the people here. I'll, I'll, what I'll say is it's this. It's like coaching a, a football team or a sports team, you know, or, or any team. Um, you have different players, and every player responds differently. Some players respond to more aggressiveness. Some people respond to, you know, when you pat them on the back. Some people, you know, need you to be very careful around them, right? Right. Um, and you have to coach every single player differently to get the most out of them. Right. You know, and, and the other part, too, is mixing the right players together. I would tell you, you know, our executive staff here, um, since I've taken over, we've, we've switched out 80% of the people in, in uh, under a year or right around a year. 
Um, and the reason why was because I want to have the perfect chemistry. Right. It's not necessarily, you know, each person is the smartest, you know, person at what they do. Um, I tell people this all the time, and, and, and it might be worthwhile, but you can find a lot of people that work really hard. You can find a lot of people who are super smart. It is really hard to find people that grind and work really hard and are crazy smart. Right. You know, and, and if you can find those people, um, that's kind of what our secret sauce is going to be. feels like everybody that you've ever introduced me to on your team, at right. here or there, has those same attributes, though. Right. They work hard. The Matt Boone's, the, yeah. the, the Diffusia's, those yeah. guys. Like, and that's, that's one thing that I was going to tell you guys at the beginning of the podcast is, Craig wouldn't tell you this, and this is not me speaking officially for Foral Parts or, or Polaris, but I believe that the company takes guys like Craig and throws them into situations where shit needs to get done aggressively, quickly, and things need to be turned around. For example, um, Foral Parts, in my opinion... Guys, again, this is, I'm, I'm being very careful to make sure that you understand that this is just 100% my opinion because I don't know the books. I don't see anything what's happening fully in here. But I remember I had a relationship with Foral Parts over the last decade. All right, I've worked with the old management. I've worked with different marketing people here. And now I've worked with you guys. And I'm working with a completely different company now than I talked to three years ago. And it's because Polaris knew, in my opinion, that a guy like you could come in here and not make small insignificant changes that would eventually lead up to be a better company. You came in and took the toy box and shook it out and, <laughs> and you literally cleaned out all the crumbs in a lot of ways, right? You feel like you feel like you had to make certain decisions, big hard decisions that affected a lot of people's lives because ultimately those were all leading to a greater good. This is me speaking. Yeah, about. I mean, well, I've, I I won't speak necessarily to the four wheel parts thing, but I will always tell you I'll never let one or two or, or ten people affect seventeen hundred and fifty. We have right. seventeen hundred and fifty employees here, and you know one person is never going to take, but you know the the center spot above all those other people. Um, yeah, I mean some it, it's 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 evolve or revolve. One of the it, every company is in one of the two spots. Right. Right. So evolve or revolve. It's every situation. Evolve or revolve. Right. So you either evolve something or go back. Are you, you are you no, or it's, or it's a revolutionary change. Right. right. So every single thing we do here or was at ORV, it was always every single year when they brought the budget in or they brought their plans for the following year in. It was like, OK, how are you evolving this to make it better? Mm -hmm. Or how is this something that we need to completely change and revolutionize? Oh, so it's evolve or revolve. You got it now? I got it. I, okay. you, I think I was using revolve off of revolution, and it was like you had to do one. They the sell two to every one. <laughs> <laughs> so how many is one? Twice as much. It's twice as much. To one. It's twice as much. <laughs> no, I like that, actually. Um, so what's the, harder? But the, Well, I think it, well, it's, it depends what the, what the situation needs. I think a lot of people, I will tell you, evolution sometimes is harder. Because if things are going really like, there was years at Polaris where we were just killing it, you know, when Razor first came out and we were just doubling every year and just, you know, printing money, right? And getting that team to realize, okay, you can't just stop there. Yeah. Right? And I always, I always use the hunting, you know, I'm not a big hunter myself, but anybody who has ever hunted, it's like, if, if you want to be a moving target or do you want to be a target sitting still? Right. Right? So the competition's shooting at where you just were. Yeah. Right? And we want to be three steps ahead of where that was. And then the year after that, they're going to be shooting at where, where you were the year before. I want to be three steps ahead of that. So it's always kind of challenging the team to say, yes, this worked last year, but that doesn't mean it's going to work now. You know what I think the hardest part of evolution would be is probably the two variables are going to be um, consistency and accountability. It's, it's doing the same thing over and over and over and continuing to be good at it, making it a habit. Because any I've seen this happen all the time with different companies and people that I've worked with. They'll come in, they'll make big changes, they'll do a lot of stuff for a while, and they will feel great, and then they just kind of plateau. They stop doing those things. They stop making those, you know, somewhat insignificant changes on a daily basis, and then the accountability side of it, nobody's watching, nobody's asking yep. what's happening, are we staying consistent, are we, are we setting new benchmarks and goals? I'm guilty of it in my own company in a lot of different ways, because sometimes it's nice to just be comfortable and just set autopilot. Like, right. autopilot is, as an owner of a business, it's one of the, like it's one of the scariest and one of the best things in the world because you want to hit it and just sit back and say, okay, let my company do what it's supposed to do. Right. But it's like, it's like watching a kid that you just taught learn how to ride a bicycle, forget how to ride his bicycle <laughs> as he's going down the street. Yeah. Like he's cruising, kicking ass and all of a sudden he gets wobbly, wobbly, wobbly and he falls. And you're like, it's like you, you go backwards. So you've had to manage a lot of people over the years. Yeah. You've had to probably implement all sorts of different management techniques and you've probably been managed by some pretty high level people. Yeah. When you talk management, because management to me, 
I mean, it's direct crossover to life, even in raising kids and relationships. What are some management strategies and techniques that you've seen that actually work in getting people to see your cause and help build it? Well, I think you have to have people who think like you, not necessarily, you know, have the same skill sets as you do, but you have to have the same people who, who want the same things, right? I mean, if, if you're, I would tell you, everybody who works here is, is a, of a certain, has certain characteristics. You know, I would say people who work at maybe Target are, you know, Cabela's are, are here. They're all going to be different people. Like right. our culture is kind of aligned that way. Mm-hmm. Hard charging, you know, be honest, you know, uh, work hard for each other. Team, team comes first, right. you know, so aligning yourself with, you know, creating a culture and then aligning yourself to that culture is kind of going to be a big part of, you know, how you're going to lead people. <clears throat> um, so for here, for instance, we create a culture here, um, you know, in cultural principles and we kind of lined them out and we launched them the whole company and they're a little different than most companies. Um, but they kind of line up to what, how we want to be. So it's like one of the big things for me is I don't want to win and win the wrong way. Like, I don't want to win and not, not be a, you know, a company that, that has honest and moral employees, right. doesn't have a safety culture, doesn't have, you know, the, uh, it's a win as a team culture. Right. You know, it's, you know, you can, there's a lot of companies that win out there and their culture is kind of, hey, everybody go and go for your own and, you know, and battle and, and things like that. We just are creating a place where if you win, you all win together. And if you lose, you lose together. Right. You know, I've seen places where one division wins and the other division loses. And then it's like, well, that, that division's great and this division sucks. Well, if, if here, if one division's, one division of the company, one sales channel's doing great and the other one's doing terrible, right. well, we're doing terrible. Yeah, it's true. So, so that's kind of, and, and so you asked a pretty simple question about what kind of people. I want people who, who grind. You know, I want, I want somebody, you know, it has to be moral and ethically and safety conscious. But when you say their name, somebody else, you can fill in the words, does whatever it takes after their name. What catches, so along those lines, when you're watching people and you're valuing people and you're figuring out who's, you know, beneficial to the company, what kind of things stand out to you? What type of behavior? Behaviors is, are people who are willing to align and work with people. What does that look like on a daily basis? Like if you ask somebody as a team to, I want, I want the guy, I want the guy in marketing to give a shit about the, what the guy in sales has to do. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, uh, that's how it works, right? That's obvious to see. It's, it's, well, yeah, it sounds obvious, but it happens so very seldomly. Yeah. Right. When we just did a Smitty built, uh, winch launch yesterday and the team has played back the folks that have been here for a while have played back. We've never had an aligned launch like that in the history of the company. And, and what it came down to was it was like, okay, the engineers and the category management guys who came up with the product mm-hmm. came up with an awesome product, yeah. right? Then they moved it into the operations and, and manufacturing section of the company. They found a way to go manufacture it. They handed over to the marketing team and the marketing team figured out a way to go tell people about it. And now the sales team has it in their hands and it's their job to go distribute it to, to people who can then sell it to customers. But in the past, all those people operated in silos. Right. And, and what happens when you operate in silos one of the things, it, it just becomes easier for one of them to drop the ball, Yeah. right? Um, I, so I was just saying, uh, giving the example to the team the other day, because I was very proud of the launch they did and how, how they put the, the plan together. And I was just telling them how proud I was and the fact that a lot of companies have great products uh-huh. and, and do a really crappy job of telling people about it. And, and, yeah, no, and, 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 then, and then the product fails. Yep. A lot of companies do a great job of marketing and sales and all that good stuff, but they're selling junk, sucks. right? It, the, the beauty and, and the sustainability part comes in when you have really great products and really innovative people and all that are good stuff, and then you align the marketing and sales and everything comes together. Mm. <laughs> okay, after a brief interruption by Diesel Dave, right after Craig was rolling. Yeah. Um, so to speak to your launch real quick, and we're kind of all over the place, so, I like it. Yeah, the launch thing, it really, what it really comes down to is I want people who are super smart, work really hard, and but want to work together, and I want to see everybody win. So I just sat down at your ice cream truck, because we're here today um, for some other stuff that we're meeting with them about, and they happened to be Joey and the company decided to throw an ice cream party for the entire company to celebrate the launch of a product. First of all, I've never seen anything like that in a company. Uh, I've seen celebrate birthday parties, special occasions, stuff like that, but you're, you're celebrating the launch of a product, which you're making it a big deal. You're making it a great experience for everybody. So as I sat down there, your ice cream truck, talking to the guys that designed the winch, you would have thought that I was talking to a kid 20 minutes after Christmas morning with all of his toys laid out, telling me about every single one and what it did and where it came from and why he loved it. He's talking about Glenn. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, he told me about how it started as a clay mold and how he went there and how he assembled this team. And he brought his whole team over, everyone from uh, the guy that managed. I, I remember exactly who, what he told me they were. This guy, this is the money behind the project. This is the brains behind the project. And then the guy with the accent. Yeah, the guy with the accent <laughs> the, who didn't want to talk to use his Jason. accent. Yeah, th- but they, he was, <laughs> dude. Jason. Oh. Yeah. These were guys that were so damn proud to be here today. And today was really just a regular day amongst any other day, like here at the office. There wasn't anything special, but you guys created this environment where this was one of the best days ever at work because they had this moment and they shared it together as a company. Not just the winch department had a great product launch. It's the guys in sales and marketing and everything across the board. It's the reason why Joey called me the other day at 930 at night, demanding to talk to me on a Friday night while I was at dinner with my wife. And I call him and he's got nice spaghetti job, in his mouth. I can tell he's at dinner too. And he's, he's <laughs> like, hold on, I got to talk to you about this. And he spends 10 minutes just, just telling me about how pumped he is about this product. So I learned a lesson from that. I really did. Like it's, I've learned a lot of lessons from you guys, believe it or not. You, you are shitheads, you're my friend, <laughs> but you're also smart guys. And there's a reason why we work well together is because you're big movers and shakers, but you're also smart in the way that you do things. A lot of times when I see Joey, I expect to just tell jokes. And then every once in a while he says something really smart. And I'm like, I forget <laughs> that there's like a smart guy in there. Like you, you're able to make like big key moves and decisions that actually it's, it's one thing to make a decision like that. It's a whole nother thing to see it through to the finish line and make sure that it's successful and make sure that it was like far and beyond the best decision for the company. I see a lot of people come in, make big moves, make big decisions, but then they don't do anything with them. They don't, they don't follow through. They don't have a consistency. They don't have yeah. the accountability. And ultimately that leads to a culture of, um, things become stagnant for sure. And that nothing gets executed, right? right. That, yeah, that's the one thing we talk about simplicity, right? And doing, doing three things incredibly well, as opposed to trying to do 15 things half-assed, right? You know, and it's, and then once you do those three, three things better than anybody else in the world, celebrate them. And don't just, to your point, everybody got some ice cream today. I, I, I'm, you know, a little sidebar. I appreciate Joyce up the ice cream truck, considering, you know, the president of the company is lactose intolerant. So I appreciate that. <laughs> There's ICs for, for, for those lactose <laughs> There was ICs. You I, didn't, that I didn't make it out there. I was in a meeting. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's, make, so how do you make a, a winch launch? Something that's, that everyone in the company is proud like of? like a birthday party. Right. But it, but it's because so many people in the company affected that. Right? right. And, and typically, you know, a marketing guy, you know, like Joey and those guys, they get all the credit cause they, they put the cool mm-hmm. videos out there. They do all the sexy stuff, right. Yep. That, you know, they're doing all the Instagram posts and all that cool stuff. But at, in the reality is it took so many people to give them the product to right. go do that with, because had they not had the cool product, that video is not that exciting. Right. Right. You know, what they're doing with the launch is not that exciting. Yeah. So this is the way to get everybody together and say, Hey, we all did this. Right. And, and when you create everybody that kind of atmosphere, they want to do it more and more and more. It, and, it, and they're not even doing it for money. That's the for best For sure. Part. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's put it, let's be real. We're, we're located in Compton, California, right. Right on the side of a highway, yep. you know, and people want to work here because of the products, because of the passion, because of the people they're working with, because of the, you know, things like today. It doesn't take a lot to celebrate success, it, but it's funny how quickly it, how quickly people ignore it. It's important to do that though. It's right. important to stop. And so we've had this conversation a lot with my guys at the shop is we talked about bonuses and one of our previous managers put together this bonus program that was great for the employees. I'm talking like you know, an average guy could make an additional 20 grand a year just in monthly bonuses. And he didn't have to hit crazy big benchmarks. It was just basically show up and do your job and have a good attitude. And, uh, I got rid of it. I just canned it because I found that nobody was doing anything exceptional and nobody was really feeling any more satisfaction, even though, though they were making a little more money on their paychecks, nobody was going home cheering, feeling like this is the best job in the world. I think everybody was still feeling like, you know, is there any better options out there looking around? And my goal as a manager is to help my guys always feel like they are in the very best place possible and they shouldn't have to look around and right. that they've got every opportunity to grow with me. So we changed that mentality and, and we're even still working on restructuring it right now, but money does not solve the problems and it does not motivate people long-term. When I look back at my career and I think of the, the big moments, not one of them had to do with a uh, check. No way. It was the things we did right. that you remember. Um, that feeling of a raise or getting that your first big check. I remember like our first big, my, you know, for the company, the first big payday. I remember that moment. Um, but other than that, that wears off. Yep. It's about these things like celebrating with the team, talking with the guys outside and seeing how excited they were to come into the office today. And there's balloons up and they all feel a part of that launch. That's the part of this whole rollout 
today was, is the best part is everyone celebrating it and feeling a part of it. The people in finance feel a part of it. Do you and know it, what we're going to call this podcast? We're going to call this rally the troops because that's, that's what you guys do really well. Like you found a way to get people to believe in your cause and to charge t- towards the same, you know, target at the same time and feel good about it. And then when they hit that target, celebrate it and then move on to the next one. That's how a successful and efficient company works. That's why Polaris sent you <clears throat> or gave you this position. I, I, I think you made a very key point there though, is move on to the next one, right? So this is the, you know, this is kind of one of the things I, I said, and I, I had I recorded a, some remarks for the company saying, you know, go enjoy the ice cream and cake and all that good stuff. And, but I talked about the culture and the cultural principles. And I talked about what we all just did together. But at the very end of it, in, in, the, in one of the most important points to make was the fact that, you know, celebrate today and then tomorrow we get right back at it and we refocus on the next thing, you know, cause I think that's a lot of, a lot of times companies look at things and people look at things, whether it be a, co- you know, your own business or a, a corporation like us, they look at things as like the goal line instead of the starting line. Right. You know, like that, just to be clear, we launched that winch. That's the starting line for that winch, right? right? We're going to be selling that winch for the next five years, right? Yeah. That's the starting line. So what are the metrics? What are the things we're doing over the next three, six, nine, 12 months to keep that the excitement that we just created today alive. And, and that's the one, you know, the first thing, once they delivered me the launch plan, it's like, what was my first, ne- what, was the ne- what was my next question? Yeah, what does it, it look like after we get it rolled out? Right. Yeah. What are you doing? What, do you, what are the key metrics? What are the things, that, how are we going to measure success? You know, it's not just sales. It's not just impressions of the number of people who see the winch and all this other good stuff. What does that look like the first month, the first three months, the first six months, the first 12 months? Right. And keeping that going, right? And, and sometimes it doesn't <clears throat> even have to be these groundbreaking, no. unique, crazy ideas it just goes back to that as consistency and accountability. It's exactly, an execution, right? It's, right? it's people paying attention. Yeah. So, and so, so for months, the whole team practiced and practiced and practiced while they were building this winch up, figuring it out, testing it, right? We're building a plan to how we're going to roll it out. That's practice. And then we launch it on Tuesday. The game just started. Right. And this game isn't over at the end of the week. You know, you have to continue to fight with that same passion all the way throughout. Right. It's important for us to celebrate, get everyone involved and let them know how important this is. But really, it's a it's a it's a long term game. Yeah. And but you you move on. You you celebrate and you get right back to practicing on the next thing yep. and get ready for that game. Um, and that's what's fun about working here is there's never a lull. There's never a moment where it's like, whew, glad that's done. Yeah. You know, glad. Wow. I guess I take a little break. No, there's none of that. It's, yeah. Get it's, up and it's go. What's next? And just, what I used yeah. to do with my old team back at Polaris when things were going really great and they're starting to get too comfortable, every once in a while I'd just go in every, go in and shake the tree. Right. It'd be like, well, everybody's happy today. I go in and shake the tree a little bit and get them, get them back on their game face a little bit. How do you, how do, you do that? What, what, you just go in there and just, I just had about call a them thousand out thoughts stuff. run through my head about shaking the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah. see this bat in the corner. <laughs> hey, now um, I've heard that you're, you're, you're a bulldog when it comes to getting shit done. So, well, no, it's just it, every once in a while, it's like, Hey, you know, it's, it's great to have fun and all that good stuff. And I want to have that kind of culture. But it's when the fun is getting in the way of getting the work done. The right. work, the work is what you're supposed to do so well at the work that that's what's fun, right? Right. And you're supposed to be so, so well. Passionate. Hold on, wait, 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 back up. Say that again. You're supposed to be so great at the work that that's what is fun. You got to make that the that's a that's a checklist item right there. Say it one more time. No, you got to. You, gotta yeah, be you so have it recorded. You just go back and listen to it. <laughs> you have to be so great at the work that that's what's fun. So rather than looking for fun at work, it's making. It's working so hard that work becomes fun. Yes. Yeah, it's being so good at what you do and, and feeling so great about how, how things are going. That's what makes you feel good. That's a pretty powerful thing. That, that right there, that alone, is a mindset that a lot of the listeners, I think, that's probably, when you, you know when you hear something and you've never thought of it that way, but when you hear it, you're like, I agree with that. That resonates with me. Like, that's powerful. I think that probably hits a lot of our people the same way because in life, we have a tendency to always just constantly be looking for more, more, more. What's next? Move on to the next thing. Um, where it, that's not always the case. Like you can, f- you can get the gratification by just staying steady with the grind and having those small wins and celebrating them along the way. That's one thing that, um, I listen to Ed Milet a lot and he talks about being able to celebrate your victories along the way. Mm-hmm. It's not okay to wait and postpone that celebration until you hit some big benchmark right. goal or hit that Ferrari on your vision board. That's, it's not okay because you'll realize that you'll get to that destination and you won't be happy. No because you've worn yourself out along the way. And so that's one thing that I constantly try to tell people is, in fact, my brother-in-law asked me this question over the weekend. Um, I love the dude, we're, we're good buddies. He's like, I, I haven't determined like what my big goal is. What's that thing that I'm working towards? What's my big, I made it moment. 
And I said, do you have to have that moment? Do you right. have, do you have something that you actually want? He's like, no, I, I just can't think about it. I'm like, you know, that's okay. Right? Like your big aha moment, your big satisfaction along the way is what you're doing day to day. Like enjoying what you have right now and enjoying those wins along the way. Sometimes that's it. Right. Sometimes that is, that is the, no, not sometimes every time that is the most powerful situation. That is the most powerful thing that you can feel is learning how to get satisfaction out of the little things rather than holding off and waiting for that one big moment. Well, and here's the deal. If you have a, if, if your, if your mindset is that, that you have this goal, that goal is the only thing you're ever going to achieve. Mm-hmm. Cause once you get there, you stop. Right. Right. I mean, that's the, that's why when you said, you know, do you ever expect to be doing this or that or the other? No, because I, I never, I, ne- I never let off off the throttle. Right. Right. You know, and don't get me wrong. There's been times when the throttle has been harder on the accelerator than, than other times, but, <laughs> but you, you can never stop dreaming of something else you want to be or want to do. Right. And, or, or you just kind of lose your drive and you just get, get stale. Right. Well, that's why most, not most successful, but there are successful people that make it and then they just feel completely unsatisfied mm-hmm. because uh, they feel like that's as the, the top that they've made it to that point and that's where they wanted to be. But then all of a sudden they realize they don't feel the way that they thought they were going to feel. And that's where a lot of the depression and you see people making yeah. crazy decisions, people that make big, crazy money, professional athletes and music artists and stuff like that get there. And then all of a sudden it's like from an outsider looking right. in, we're like, why are you making those stupid decisions? You got everything at your fingertips, but the person's not happy right. because they didn't learn how to be happy along the way. And they, and they learned or they trained themselves to think that once they got to a certain level, then they could just chill out. Right. I don't think you should ever chill out. I think you should constantly be pushing and pushing. I mean, I watched, you know, my grandparents do that, just push until the day they died. And that was a good example for me to watch as you just don't become complacent. It doesn't mean that when you're 80 years old, that you're going to go out and be able to start companies and, you know, shake shit up like you used to, but constantly, constantly growing. So I think I want to wrap this up by talking to the listeners a little bit about, you got to realize that our average listener is probably 30 years old. Um, a lot of, lot of uh, couples listen to this together. A lot of newlywed couples, younger families, uh, we found listen to this podcast together. So men and women, talk to these people a little bit about any sort of principles, techniques, dumb things, little things, habits, things that you've learned over the years that you've implemented. Because we call this the heavy checklist. And the reason it's a checklist is I like to keep things super simple. I like to oversimplify things a lot of times so that I can just look at my to-do list or my checklist and say, okay, bam, bam, bam. I'm doing those things. I'm good. That's, that's what keeps you on track. So the purpose of this is to help people just refer back to these dumb little simple things that sometimes we overlook and hit those marks. So I'll let you guys talk on that. If you have anything that you want to. Well, I'll, I'll say to go along with a point that Craig was making earlier about, um, you know, making the work, you know, something that you celebrate and take pride in and enjoy the most. Um, you know, I'll drive on this, on the winch thing. You know, I celebrated 10 times during the process. Of Every time I say the word launch. winch, you get this big shit eating grin yeah. on your face. Yeah, like, enough well, celebration. Get back to work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality is, is I, I had a little moment when we got the catalog done at a moment when we established our creative, a moment when the video was completed and the biggest celebration, even bigger than for me than to see it roll out was when the plan came together. Right. So really enjoying the little things. And that can be said for your work and for life, you know, taking a step back and realizing that, you know, the work will always be there, making time with your family, making time with your friends. Right. Um, and, and also just really enjoying those little moments. And give uh, yourself some credit for that accomplishment. A lot of people are trained to think that, you know, they, they, they overlook certain things that they do or they feel egotistical or they feel cocky or whatever it is, celebrating those wins. It's okay to celebrate your wins big time, especially with yourself. I'm my biggest cheerleader. Like hands down, I, cheer, I, I that's why people, I, 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 you know, people I've been accused of being overly confident throughout my entire life. Maybe I am, but guess what? It's got me to the places that I want to be. I believe that I can do something even when a guy like me should not believe I should be able to accomplish certain things. You know what I mean? Well, for social, social media, for, for at least me, I think a little bit of you, it's, it's kind of a history of my celebrations. If I'm posting it there, yeah. it's because I'm proud of it. Yep. If it's a picture of my, my, my car, uh, it's because I'm proud of it. If it's a, my wife and I standing at a wedding, I'm proud to Dude, be there. Dude, that's why I there, post right? stuff like, on my page. Those little, right. It's, it, those are my moments to celebrate that. And yep. at times it can look like, oh, you know, there's Joey again or... bragging, right? But that's just, I guess it's just a way of right. showing like, hey, I'm proud of this. I posted the winch on my yep. on my own feed because I'm proud of that. And yep. I'm proud of my team for coming mm-hmm. together and our team for putting that together and helping push that out. So 
yeah, I mean, I think I can go with that too, of making sure that so it's okay to be proud yeah. of what you do and to celebrate that stuff, you know? Celebrate it with yourself, celebrate with your team, celebrate with your wife, your family, whoever, like whatever the win is and wherever it applies in your life, take time to be pumped on. My wife and I do this all the time. Like anytime we get better at something or we do something that's like really good for the family, it's one thing that we just do. We just naturally talk about it and we're pumped and we love it. And we like, we'll spend a day relishing and how great we good, how great we feel about that accomplishment. I love that part of my marriage because we've learned how to celebrate those things together. And it's not like she's on her own or I'm on my own celebrating that stuff. It's something that we accomplished together and it's made our marriage way stronger. Uh, the other checklist thing too here is, uh, you know, don't get caught up in feeling like you have to own your own company and that's success. Yeah. That, that is not, that does not define you. You can definitely be an entrepreneur, find success working inside of a corporate structure, working for another small business, whatever it might be. And that it's okay. It I, really is. Dude, you heard me preach that at the academy. I preach that everywhere I go because I hate watching people feel stressed. I get four, five, six hundred DMs a day from people saying, dude, I want to start my own company. I feel like I got to go out and do this. I want to do this. I want to do that. And they tell me their idea and it's shit. Like nine times out of 10, their ideas are terrible. And I just want to be like, that's not a good idea. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to tell you not to pursue your dreams, but maybe there's a different way you could approach this. If you really feel like you want to own your own company, then you need to be able to like have those hard conversations with yourself and think about not just the good that could come from it, but the shitty part that comes from being yep. your own boss. Um, and like you said, just know that it's like, just cause society says you should own your own business or be an entrepreneur. There's a little more value to me, what you guys do. Dude, you're, you're building me. a company. It's not always all it's things. cracked up to <clears throat> be, man. It's, it's a, it's a, what are you talking tough, about? The place is great for you. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is definitely <laughs> great for me. I love it here. I, I literally am. I I have a ball coming to work, and that's something I said. Um, you know, I lost along the way with UTV Honor. I always loved it to right. the very end. Still love it. Um, but I lost a little bit of that early passion. So when people ask me what are the best times of your career, you would expect, oh man, you know, nearing the end when I finally started making money or whatever it was. But no, the best times were literally when I had nothing, yep. spending all night working on a laptop on, on my couch, just trying to sell the next banner ad so I can pay the car payment. You need to enjoy the hell out of those glory days. But those days were the best yep. because it was like nothing else mattered. Mm -hmm. Nothing else mattered. I had to win today. Yep. It wasn't about this big picture and this, you know, um, inspiration board or right. whatever. It, none of that mattered. I, I couldn't think about a Ferrari. I had to think about my electric not getting <laughs> shut off. That was the real <laughs> that deal. That was the win for the day. And, but I love that time. Right. And this has brought back a lot of that. Uh, granted, I'm not, you know, having to work on a couch on my little laptop no, and way more and not worrying about the your paying car a, payment anymore. Yeah. Not paying a tra <laughs> not living in a single nice. wide trailer, straight up, allowance. you know, but, um, but the grind, <laughs> yeah, that passion's there, that grind, yeah. you know, we have so much to do here and I'm so excited about that. And that's special. And then the other thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll leave it at that is surround yourself with people you want to be like. You know, it's the truth is I heard it when I was a kid. I think my mom told me this. I was running with a bad crowd is you become who you hang out with. Yeah. And that really carries on through life. Yeah. Um, if you hang out with, a, if all your, your friends are mid-level people, you're going to be a mid-level guy. Let's talk about how is. uncomfortable that is though. Let's say you've got your group of friends and you've got your lifestyle and you got your thing. If you want to level up and find a new group of friends, it's not always easy. No, it's not. It's not easy, but you, it, you might have to go take swimming lessons. Your or, daughter just did it. Absolutely. You just gave me, the, you gave me the example the other day about, about Mia. Yep. My daughter did. She, she got sucked into a bad crowd and she wasn't doing like bad, bad things, right. but we were watching this girl with so much talent and, and you know, she's a rodeo queen right. and she's just the best, the best all American girl. And she got hooked up with a friend that she'd been friends with a long time. And it started to drag her down and take her a wrong direction. And we were able to show her what she was doing wrong. She corrected herself. Mm. And now here she is. She's texting guys like Craig. Huh. She's a junior in high school thinking about her career. That's yeah, awesome. she, texts she, me, she texts me asking what she should go to school for and ask for advice and things like that. And it's no like, way. and I didn't even and, know that. And he, 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 I didn't even, you didn't even know until like no. the other day, it was like three months ago. She texted me and I was like, that's awesome. He's like, did Mia text you about her? I'm like, I probably should have ran that by her parents before <laughs> I started giving her college <laughs> advice. <laughs> Dude, I love that. But you become who you, you surround for yourself sure. with. Of course, I want to be around guys like Craig and the people I work with, yeah. man, I mean, I'm here a lot and thank goodness I'm surrounded by guys like Jason, the future, and even guys on my team. I got a guy named Thomas on my team. I mean, dude, hustlers, they're good at the, they, you know, they work hard to perfect their craft. They make me a better person, right? you know, and um, I love that. 
I but feed off. In that. order to be able to feed off that, you have to contribute to it. You do. You yeah. have to contribute, and you have to be willing to sacrifice and maybe step step away mm-hmm. from a crowd and put some people at arm's length that you know you love, and maybe it's family or people you've grown up with. And I had to do that at one point, and I still have those people in my life that you know are not the people I want to bring to my office here. Right. You know, they're just guys I grew up with, and right. they're and I love them like brothers. But they're not guys that I'm going to go and surround myself around, you know, put right. myself around on a daily basis anymore. You know, I need to be around high level people. So I want to be a high level person. Yeah. Um, so that's just something that I think a lot of people can learn from is I love it. find those mm-hmm. people you can surround yourself with that you want to be like. Yeah, we preach that a lot. Can I get my checklist now? Let's hear it. Well, I, I got a couple I, I, more. You, you can keep going you know. if you want. I mean. Is the floor open, Joey? Yeah. I feel like this is recess for you. Like you should be down in your office doing work. But. Oh, I know. I, 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 can we keep talking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I think being your worst, your being your own worst critic is a big deal, right? But not dwelling either. Um, when I do something wrong or something doesn't get done right here, I, I, nobody needs to tell me, right. right? And I think a lot of a lot of people, kids, adults, whatever have a hard time looking in the mirror once in a while and saying, you know what? I could have done that better. And the only way you can get better at something is if you realize what you did wrong. So, so you're saying this it. is something that you should, you should allow yourself to experience and feel because a lot of yeah, people say, totally. a lot of people say, don't worry, you're your own worst critic. You know, I'll say that to my wife all the time. No. She's looking in the mirror and she's not feeling great. You're your own worst critic, but nobody needs to beat me up. Cause I know, cause I've already beaten up myself worse than anybody else so that I don't do that again. That's, Simple as that. Um, I'd appreciate you not, calling me out. I know I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> the minute you become your own worst critic, I will, I will not do that, Joey. Um, realize developing other people is developing yourself. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, for, for me, um, the teams and the people that work, I work with me or work for me, um, them winning and them being successful means I'm successful. Right. I mean, I've watched uh, one of the guys here, Evan Keller. He's he's been working for me since he was an intern in college, wow. and now he's you know now he runs all of, all of four parts. Now he's the VP of Sales for Transamerica. Jeez, you know, and uh, and he's still a pretty young guy. He's still you know thirty years old, but you know I've watched him develop, and I've watched him get paid more, and him have more success, and this, that, and the other. Well, guess what? If he is, I probably am too. So you're telling me it's true when they say the easiest way to make it to the top is by taking other people with you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Totally. Right. A um, couple other things too. Make sure you mentor others and give back. Yeah. Not, you know, a lot of folks that over the years um, have come to work, you know, for me or, you know, with me um, have been folks I've mentored over the years. Never worked for me, you know, all that situation, just folks that every once in a while needed some help could come talk to me. And be a great, you know, be a great mentee as well. Yeah. So find people that that have different skills than you, um, you know, have been, had different experience of you. That cycles a learning thing we talked about before. Um, be a good mentor and, and be able to be mentee. It takes a certain level of self confidence to be able to mentor somebody though, because then you have to actually believe that you are in a position to be able to improve that person's life with the advice that you're giving them. I mean, sometimes you want to be take the humble approach, and if I ask you for business advice, you'd be like, you know, why are you asking me? Um, you got to be able to have that confidence to know. And if you don't, if you're not comfortable giving advice, don't, right. don't, don't just like sometimes listening is way more powerful than giving generic bullshit advice that yeah, you don't totally. actually believe. No, not sure. sometimes every time. Yeah. And <laughs> the other thing too is, you know, and the thing we push around here is never be happy. Never be overly happy. You know what I mean? It's like, you gotta, you gotta balance, right? Don't be, don't ever put yourself down so far that you can't pick yourself back up, but don't ever over celebrate anything either. Right. You know, we won the Baja 500 this year, my team, my race, I have a race team and we won the Baja 500 this year. And you know, Joey would come in here and be like, I still can't believe we won the Baja 500. It's like, dude, that was last weekend. You know, it's like, let's move on. Yeah, but that's um, a bit, that's a hard race and it's a no, big I still blown away. I, 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 I still want to hold I, I actually, I actually right forgot now. about that. I, yeah, no, that's how I threw that little public service. I, no, I love myself that. I, I wanted to talk about your racing. I forgot because I know how hard you've been going at this. It's not like you went out there one day and won the Baja 500. No. I've watched you get your ass kicked uh, in races between races that I was actually at and races that I've watched online. Like, it's so funny watching people on race weekend, like, 
Thursday, they're putting out this big motivational post talking about how they're <laughs> prepped and ready. And then Friday morning, they're like at mile marker 280. I lost the train. I was leading the race. I don't do that. I just shut her down. <laughs> 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 it's like, here's the pre-race stuff and I'll see you next race. Yeah, done. <laughs> no, uh, but, but you know, it's don't over celebrate, you know, it's yeah. like, it's time to move on, you know, and, and be super pumped and look back that, that way you can look back on things and, and be psyched about them. Like I'll look back 10, 15 years from now, 20 right. years from now, I'll be psyched about the Baja 500, the experience I have with all those folks and like i said celebrate it just don't over celebrate it don't let something be the defining moment of your life wow yeah find balance right don't let something be defining moment of your life right you want to have multiple defining moments of your life i was gonna say that goes against if you have one defining moment that means you do not have multiple defining moments and that means that you haven't accomplished everything that you could have yeah that's true i mean no i love that dude that's powerful stuff those are those talking points that you just went over are things that apply to really everything, whether it's your marriage, your relationship, your work, like environment. Obviously those are things that you've implemented in your career in management and you're a very successful manager. You've done a good job at uh, getting huge groups of people to want to do the same thing at the same time. So yeah. well, uh, ice cream and cake helps. Ice cream and cake definitely <laughs> helps, uh, especially guys like Joey. Um, the one last thing is my grandfather always used this one, and I use this one a lot in meetings. Like people in me be in meetings, and I always say, um, it's an old baseball thing because when I would play baseball, don't wait for the ball to come to you to know where you're going with it. So it, the the saying is always know where you're going with the ball. That's what I say. I'll say that around here to people, and they know what I mean. It's uh, you know, don't wait until something happens. You know, in order to in, to make the decision on what you're going to do next. You know, you have to anticipate, right? So you right. have to, here's what's going on in my, in my career, you know, what's next and what, always anticipating where you're going to go. Um, it's the folks that, you know, you might be playing third base in baseball, the ball gets hit to you. And then you go, okay, do I throw it the first base, second base, or home plate? Yeah, I'm that guy. Yeah, I, I can yeah. see that. I don't know if uh, watched the Celebrity All-Star game, but <laughs> I once threw a 17-run inning uh, in one inning. They got 17 <laughs> runs off of me, and we lost. And my, my, my team captain, Jamie Foxx, was not happy. So you're bigger I, than him though, right? I was bigger than everybody on the team, but it's, they, I felt like <laughs> the smallest serving, guy on the team after serving I, cookies. Dude, I was keeping them everything I had. And Dave sat there. I, at one point, I think I looked up in the stands and Dave just got <laughs> like head in his lap, like disowning me. So it's hard to watch. A baseball it's hard to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, I love it, man. That's all very powerful stuff. Obviously, like I said, I look up to both of you guys because you've, you've accomplished a lot. And I love the fact that you're kind of like the bash brothers in a way that you came into um, a bunch, you know, whether it be Polaris, Foral Parts, or whatever it is you're doing, you align your goals, you make a plan, and then you just go attack. That's the way that you're supposed to do things. But you don't just go attack first because otherwise you're just a shit show. It's right. just chaos. People don't know what they're doing. Uh, so you guys are very strategic in the way that you've done things. So if um, for our listeners who want to learn more about this, I would follow Scanlon Motorsports. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's at Scanlon Motorsports on Instagram. Uh, he's got a great page, talks about their, their racing side. He doesn't talk much about your business and personal no. life. It's more about your racing. That's your main page, right? Yeah. You post most of your stuff on. Uh, Joey, your page is Joey D23. That's it. Uh, on Instagram. Um, you post They're going to be so disappointed because they heard all this business stuff today. They're going to go to our page. It's going to be his, his <laughs> it's going to be his Cadillac <laughs> in my race car. Yeah, I got a cool Cadillac. Go check it out. <laughs> but it's, it's cool because it does in a mini way, shows you guys celebrating your wins along the way. Um, but also just keep an eye on, on four wheel parts in general. Like if you're interested in business and watching some cool, big, interesting moves, just watch the four wheel parts, Instagram or their YouTube page, because everything that they're doing here is reflected on there. Um, I mean, I wish everybody could see internally what I'm seeing because I'm seeing like, holy shit, like massive shifts and changes. And I can tell you right now that you guys are the best thing that ever happened to this company, my personal humble opinion. Um, and I can't wait to see where you guys take it and who knows what's next. It like, you're going to get to the point where this thing is just running, you know, you keep on uh, referencing, how do you put it? You say, what's well, this thing singing or something like that? You, know, okay. you, you want to get this thing singing and you gotta and, be and running just, full song. Yeah. Running full song. There you <laughs> go. He's uh, got a, he's got a bunch of great ones. Yeah, like There's I, times he says stuff like, you know, like the old West coast thing, like, you know, let's go riff on this or let's go break the internet. And but he has some sayings and I'm just like, what is he talking about? But it's, he's saying it so passionately that it, I don't want to, I don't want to stop him. It comes from like, his soul. Just keep going. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you guys are doing big things and I appreciate your example and uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk to our listeners because these people need this information. So guys, real quick to recap the checklist, Marcus, you wrote, uh, wrote it down. I so. got a page and a half of notes. Um, uh, first one, uh, 
I, I don't know if this is a checklist or not, but be grind or be smart and grind hard. Yeah, was one of them. Yeah. Um, you have to be so great at the work that the work is the fun. Yep. Enjoy the little moments. It's okay to be an intrapreneur rather than an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Uh, surround yourself with people you want to be like. Be your own worst critic. Um, develop other people is developing yourself. Uh, mentor others and give back. And always know where you're going with the ball. Sure, let's go with it. I like it. That's all good stuff. And and obviously, do you create like a master list after all your podcasts? We're working on that. That'd be uh, kind of cool. I think it's going to become a book. To be honest with yeah, you, kind of um, cool with different chapters. Because, dude, we literally we've had everything from I've one of my checklist items. I told people to go out and buy this certain brand of chip that I really liked. It's more about sharing things. Like how how do you listen to much music? Are you a music sure. guy? Do you like it when people share new music with you you'd never heard before? Yeah. I love when somebody introduces me to music that it's like, oh, how did I not know this existed? So it's the same concept. Like I want to share with people things that maybe, maybe a lot of people know about it, but there's a lot of people listening. And we found that by the downloads and the reviews and this podcast became number two in the world in 48 hours when we launched it. Number two in the world. No, was it number three or four? No, we went to one. It was number one in business and it was either number two or number four. We were right below Joe Rogan um, because when it came out, people were like, it's just simple. It's basic. And it works. Like we've had people, our first episode, we told people to take cold showers because it's something that has like huge health benefits, but nobody wants to go take a cold shower, but people started doing it and they started feeling these results. We get hundreds of emails and messages every day. So that's the point of this. Um, and so guys, I would encourage you to listen and take these guys advice because these are both very successful people who have done big things. And in my opinion, in a lot of ways, you're just getting started. So excited to see where you guys go and appreciate you being on the show. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. There you go.